The Philosophy of Praxis, Marx, Lucas, and the Frankfurt School by Andrew Feinberg. This is chapter three, Metacritique of the Concept of Nature. Marx's Concept of Nature. As I explained in the previous chapter, Marx sought to realize philosophy and to develop a new concept of reason based on the practical identity of subject and object metacritically reconstructed in the domain of labor. The dialectic of the natural subject and object of labor now carries the weight of idealistic identity theory. This is the first appearance in philosophy of praxis of its most difficult conundrum, which Lucas and the Frankfurt School must also address. The problem can be formulated simply. How can the subject, once naturalized, constitute its natural objects? This chapter will focus primarily on Marx's solution. In conclusion, and in anticipation of the detailed discussion in chapter 6, I will introduce some basic resources developed by later thinkers addressing the same problem. Marx writes, that the physical and mental life of man and nature are interdependent means simply that nature is interdependent with itself, for man is a part of nature. By itself, such a statement only classifies man as a natural being without elucidating the essence of nature or establishing man's active powers in the natural world. However, Marx aims to prove more than this. He wants to convince us that the unity of man and nature results from human labor, which objectifies human faculties in transforming natural objects. This is the form in which human creative power in nature is most completely expressed. But since man is a natural being, it is also the self-relation of nature. Alfred Schmidt summarizes Marx's conception as follows. The hidden nature speculation in Marx holds that the different economic formations of society, which have, which have succeeded each other historically, have been so many modes of nature's self-mediation. Sundered into two parts, man and material to be worked on, nature is always present to itself in this division. Nature attains self-consciousness in men and amalgamates with itself by virtue of their theoretical practical activity. Human participation in something alien and external to them appears at first to be something equally alien and external to nature. But in fact, it proves to be a natural condition of human existence, which is itself a part of nature, and it therefore constitutes nature's self-movement. Only in this way can we speak meaningfully of a dialectic of nature. Marx's materialism is thus quite different from all previous materialisms since he believes that human consciousness is a moment in nature's self-development and not an external spectator on the latter. However, his position is not without problems. Throughout the manuscripts, one senses that there is something wrong with his concept of subject-object identity. In claiming that man himself becomes the object, to cite but one example among many, he seems to hover between hyperbole and absurdity. Reading such passages, one wonders if he really means it. The grandeur, but also the paradox of this culminating aspect of the theory consists in the universality of Marx's claims for human labor. He is not content to confine human creative powers to the narrow domain that mankind actually and potentially transforms in an imaginable labor process, but wants to extend those powers to objective reality everywhere. Under what conditions can human beings, qua social beings, with their fully developed subjective capacities, recognize consubstantiality with objective reality everywhere as the reality of human faculties? Will not the realm of independent nature always transcend society, hence the human subject? In short, will not human beings always be strangers in the universe? 
whatever their social interactions. Marx seems to argue the contrary, that under the appropriate social conditions, it will be possible to recognize the essence of nature as human activity. Formally, this recognition exactly parallels Vico's notion that history is knowable as a human product. Just as this notion opens the way to the dereification of history and the recognition of human creative power in the historical domain, so Marx wants to dereify nature and attribute to human beings a comparable creative power in the natural domain. The paradox results from casting the dialectics of the labor process in the form of identity philosophy, metacritically redefining the subject and object as labor and material. The resulting theory is profoundly unsatisfactory. It is not only that some things are unimaginable as potential objects of labor. Equally questionable is the reduction of the fundamental human relation to nature to labor. It is, do it is by no means self-evident that the transformative impulse is the primary one through which being is disclosed. In everyday coping, play, aesthetic appreciation, recognition, and contemplation, humans relate to being perhaps just as fundamentally as they do in labor without attempting to remake objects in their own image. And to these less active modes of involvement in the world, there correspond dimensions of the real, perhaps just as fundamental as any revealed to the laboring subject. Marx is reacting against idealism, which sums up access to reality in the concept of consciousness. And he may well be right to protest that a more fundamental practical relation to the real should have priority. Yet the imaginable extension of the concept of an object of consciousness is in truth far greater than that of an object of labor. Thus, if a Fichte or a Berkeley were to declare that consciousness itself becomes the object, we might disagree with the philosophical premises that lead to such a conclusion. But at least the notion of consciousness refers potentially to every possible object. The idealistic conclusion need not be rejected out of hand because consciousness self-evidently requires an obje object irreducible to it. Marx thus encounters a barrier to generalizing his concept of the object of labor from the human scale to the totality of nature. The universe is not, in principle, mere raw material. The very idea is either absurd or abhorrent. Even admitting that Lieber achieves subject-object identity in a partial domain such as history, this still falls short of the requirements of philosophy of praxis. As a result, the whole Kantian problematic of the thing in itself threatens to return for alongside history in which subject and object are one in labor. Another sphere of nature and natural science must be distinguished in which man is not the object. Instead of accepting the Kantian view, Marx elaborated a theory of sensation in which the senses become directly theoreticians in practice, acting on their objects as does the worker on his raw materials. The senses, unlike labor, have traditionally been conceived as a potentially universal mode of reception, relating to all possible real objects. The senses can therefore take over where actual labor leaves off, supporting the assertion of a universal identity of subject and object in nature. Marx's theory of sensation is distinguished by his metacritical reconstruction of the senses as a historically evolving dimension of human being. He argues that the object of sensation contains a wealth of meaning available only to the trained and socially developed sense organ. In alienated society, man experiences nature as a dog or cat might experience a symphony. And just as the musical ear recognizes itself affirmed in the music it hears, so will liberated humanity recognize itself affirmed in nature. The distinctive character of each faculty is precisely its characteristic essence and thus also the characteristic mode of its, ob is its objectification, of its objective real, living being.
It is therefore not only in thought, but through all the senses that man is affirmed in the objective world. On these terms, the emancipated senses are active transformers of their objects and not mere passive receptors. They can be understood at, on the model of the labor processes engaging in a theoretical practical activity, objectifying human nature, and releasing the implicit potentialities of the material on which they work, in this case as meanings rather than as artifacts. For the early Marx, the senses are alienated in the alienation of labor. Only under communism can the senses achieve their highest pitch of perfection. When the revolution transforms the senses by abolishing alienation, it attains the core of being itself, as required by the philosophy of praxis. The suppression of private property is, therefore, the complete emancipation of all the human qualities and senses. The eye has become a human eye when its object has become a human, social object created by man and destined for him. Revolution unites subject and object in liberated sensation and thereby reveals the truth of nature. But can one really speak of truth in this context? Conceivably, the historically evolved senses of communist man are different from those of man in class society. But are the senses in any case significantly related to the truth about nature? Is it not natural science that discovers this truth? often by the most arduous effort to transcend the given social sensory horizon toward deeper representations. In the manuscripts, Marx explicitly rejects the epistemo epistemology implied by these questions and with it the existing natural sciences as well. Marx insists that he is seeking the unifying truth of both idealism and materialism. Given his quasi-naturalistic assumptions, he cannot claim that the senses posit their objects in some sort of prior constitution. This would be to deny the reality of nature while affirming the natural, sensory character of man, an obvious contradiction. He therefore argues, on the one hand, that the sense object is real and not simply a product of consciousness. On the other hand, he rejects any notion of a thing in itself transcendent to per to perception in principle. His position is compatible with neither realism nor Kantianism. Marx cannot allow, as does British empiricism, that the sense object is merely a sign, causally or otherwise connected with a real object. If the sensed object is only a sign or image, then no real unity of subject and object is achieved as Kant's first critique makes abundantly clear. The real object is not humanized by sensation in realistic and critical epistemology, but flees behind experience to where it can be reached through thought alone, if at all. Marx therefore rejects the attempt to conceive nature as a reality transcendent to sensation. Nature too, he writes, taken abstractly for itself and rigidly separated from man is nothing for man. To this abstract nature, he opposes the concrete, lived nature of direct sensory experience. Marx's synthesis of idealism and materialism thus culminates in a unique form of phenomenalism. Marx rejects the natural sciences for their abstract materialistic or rather idealistic orientation. His critique might be elaborated more fully as follows. The materialist interpretation of science asserts the reality of the ideal objects of scientific laws, in contrast with the mere appearances perceived by the senses. But the ideal objects of science are objects of thought, and so via materialism we return to the basic premise of idealism, the notion that in its essence being is an object of thought and not of a natural, sensuous subject. This is merely a secularized version of the theological priority of spirit over matter. Marx's own radical epistemological atheism insists on locating both appearance and reality in the sphere of sensation, as levels or degrees in the unveiling of what is. The truth of the object does not lie beyond sensation or in thought, but in truer and deeper sensation. 
in the developed and liberated senses of social man. Only on this assumption can Marx overcome the split between man and nature, threatening his philosophy of praxis. Now science must be transformed in its methods and its structure. Following Farbach and definitely not Locke, Marx states, sense experience must be the basis of all science. Presumably the perceptions of the liberated senses can be raised to consciousness by a new science, although it is difficult to imagine in what form. Furthermore, the division of natural and social science must be overcome. The very object of natural science has been off Gehoben, and in its place stands the humanized nature disclosed to liberated sensation. There will be, Marx prophesizes, a single science. Marx seems to be saying that a reformed science will, in studying nature, really be studying the objectifications of man's socialized senses, hence man himself. The first object for man, man himself, is nature, sense experience, and the particular sensuous human faculties, which can only find objective realization in natural objects, can only attain self-knowledge in the science of natural being. The social reality of nature and human natural science, or the natural science of man, are identical expressions. In these passages, Marx takes the step that Lucas later refused to take, the rejection of the existing natural sciences as the precondition for a radical historicization of the concept of nature. Undergirding the abstractly conceived nature of the existing sciences, there is a primordial practical relation of human subject to natural object. This practical relation cannot be explained as an external interaction between the sort of entities conceived by natural science, but constitutes a more fundamental reality. The next step, which Marx did not take, would be the development of a philosophy of nature based on a teleological concept of being, as in essence subordinate to human aims. Rather than go this route, Marx rejects his entire early philosophy. In the works immediately following the manuscripts, particularly in the theses on Feuerbach, and the German ideology, he begins to backtrack. He first rejects not so much the premises of the manuscripts as the conclusion they were supposed to establish, the identity of subject and object. In the German ideology, for example, Marx sets out at one point to prove that the entire universe is a product of human sensuous activity. But in the very middle of a passage that could have been lifted from the manuscripts, he suddenly notes, of course the priority of external nature remains, and all this has no application to the original men produced by generatio equivoca. This is a damaging admission from the point of view of his earlier philosophy of praxis. It presupposes that nature can be meaningfully conceived apart from man, and so presumably comprehended in abstraction from its sensuous appearance. Perhaps this implication still makes Marx a bit uncomfortable, for he immediately tries to patch things up. He continues, But this differentiation has meaning only insofar as man is considered distinct from nature, a perspective which Marx assures us is irrelevant in the modern world, where industry has transformed nature, except on a few Australian coral islands of recent origin. These are schoolboy squirmings compared with the daring and rigor of the manuscripts and show to what extent Marx has abandoned his philosophy of praxis, even though some of his arguments still tend toward establishing his old conclusions. Such hesitation and wavering occur several times in the first part of the German ideology, where occasional passages prepare proofs of the identity of subject and object despite the fact that Marx now ridicules the very terminology in which such a conclusion would have to be stated. Soon, even this backhanded reference to the philosophy of praxis of the manuscripts is dropped and Marx plunges into economic and historical research. Marx's later concept of nature is not based on philosophical arguments, but on a materialistic faith in science. 
Yet some important aspects of the philosophy of praxis survive the abandonment of its most daring theses. The early Metacritic continues to influence his later works. It will be recalled that the Metacritic has three moments, the first two of which reconstruct the categories of identity, philosophy, and social reality, while the third resolves the philosophical antinomies of that philosophy through projecting the historical transformation of the reconstructed terms. The later works restrict the Metacritic to reified forms of social thought. The metacritically reconstructed categories still interact dialectically in history, but the resolution of the antinomies no longer has ontological import. It was left to Engels to elaborate on ontology corresponding to the social theory of the mature Marx. He did so in numerous articles and books that espouse an unabashed naturalism. Marx himself seems to have accepted this as a satisfactory substitute for the philosophy of praxis. Lucas was, of course, aware of Engels' views that he condemned as pre-critical, still unawakened from the dogmatic slumbers, Kant interrupted for all time. On this point, Lucas is undoubtedly right. Existential Marxism, central to philosophy of praxis, is the idea that the truth of being is historical becoming. But it is also from this idea that the antinomy of society and nature arises. This philosophy attempts to transpose the concept of subject-object identity from metaphysics to social practice. In support of this project, philosophy of praxis argues that being is disclosed to the subject in a practical relation, such as needing, laboring, or historical action. The dialectical interdependence of the practically related subject and object is then taken as paradigmatic for subject-object relations in general. The antinomy arises from difficulties in understanding the concept of nature on these terms. The methodological dimension of this antinomy concerns the relation of theory to practice. So-called external nature is a privileged object of theoretical contemplation. As, as Lucas argues, even the corresponding technical practice in which nature is manipulated is basically contemplative in the sense that it passively obeys the laws disclosed to theory. The matter stands quite differently with society and history that are human, sorry, yeah, that are humanly created in their very being. Practice actually produces the objects that appear in their created ind independence as objects of thought and which in turn reproduce the practice that produced them. Here the objects of theory are objectifications of practice, which later which latter is therefore no merely derivative function of theory. The contingency of the laws of social life on practice is without parallel in the domain of natural science. At issue in the ontological question of whether external nature has priority over social reality or vice versa is the methodological question of whether theory or practice has epistemological priority. In turn, on this depends whether or not subject and object can be united. In the customary representation of theory, subject and object are not identical, but distinctly separate. The ideal of truth as correspondence of thing and intellect presupposes the separation of the terms it brings into relation. The subject of theory occupies a position beyond all but cognitive connection with its objects and unites with them, not in reality, but in knowledge. In a, in a specular relation, i.e. speculatively. This tenuous subject-object relation of theory is utterly unlike the practical relation the early Marx requires. He insists that subject-object identity be demonstrated by explaining the real process of production of the thought objects of theory. This involves no merely reflective correspondence of thought in things, but an act of creating but can practice serve this ambitious philosophical purpose. Marx argues that only real objects can exist in practical relations. 
but by real objects we usually mean objects that are independent of the subject. It is thus that we distinguish an objective thing from a subjective one that can only exist in the mind. We assume that the reality of objects is verified in knowledge, by which we distinguish the real from the illusory or misconstrued. Objectivity is revealed, not to practice, but to thought. It involves not the strong dialectical interrelatedness of a doing, but the weak and contingent relation of a knowing. Since our ordinary conception of practice presupposes the objectivity of its moments, the very attempt to make practical primordial appear appears to be self-contradictory. This contradictory result is reached because Marx rejects idealism and insists on defining the subject-object relation as a real practical relation between real objects without sufficiently clarifying his concept of reality. He intends for practice to found objectivity and yet he implies the contrary, that objectivity is independent of practice and founding for it. His philosophy of praxis would thus be bounded by some sort of traditional ontology and its corresponding form of contemplative rationality. This boundary is reached in interpretations such as Habermas's in which nature in itself lies beyond the horizon of social practice as a permanently reified external substratum society can never touch in its being, but only know. Some Marxists have concluded that a speculative nature of a speculative nature philosophy can complete the philosophy of praxis, once and for all subordinating nature to historical practice. They attempt to conceive a practical prior to and founding for the objectivity of nature. In such theories, society's meaning positing functions are conceived as a generative principle for nature, or nature itself is conceived as a living organism of which humanity would be the conscious faculty. Yet even here in the context of the most ambitious attempt to found philosophy of praxis, the antinomy of society in nature reappears. The historical practice which, for Marxism, founds the objectivity of social objects is the real practice of identifiable human subjects in social groups. The practice in which speculative philosophy conceives the constitution of nature does not have this real character, but is a conceptual mythology. To the extent that Marx hints at a solution to the problem, he looks to a revision of the concept of objectivity as the precondition for conceiving subject-object identity with real subjects and objects. Unfortunately, he does not follow through adequately on this requirement of a consistent philosophy of praxis. He offers daring suggestions for transforming the concept of nature, but he rarely sketches the metacritical revision of the concept of objectivity on which they depend. We will see that Lucas employs different conceptual means to address a similar problem with somewhat more plausible results if not entirely successfully. It is still noteworthy that both Marx and Lucas arrive independently at a similar break with the usual concept of objectivity. The essence of their approach is the rejection of the hypothetical absolute subject that serves as, a, as an epistemological model for traditional theory of knowledge. The absolute subject has the power to shatter the hard-won unity of subject and object by positing external nature as reality. They therefore deny that it is meaningful even to imagine an, an observer that could perceive and question the universe from outside, from a disincarnated position of pure thought, the famous view from nowhere. In its regulative employment as an ideal of knowledge, this hypothesis is an ultimate theological postulate they must expunge from philosophy. The epistemology that derives from their critique is closer to Nietzsche's than to Hegel's, with whom Marx and Lucas are usually compared. <clears throat> 
It is true that, like Hegel, they regard knowledge as a historical outcome, but they deny the possibility of a final synoptic wisdom, such as that in which Hegel's philosophy culminates. Rather, the tendency to which they belong would say with Nietzsche, let us from now on be on our guard against the hollowed philosopher's myth um, of a pure, willless, painless, timeless knower. Let us behear, let, sorry, let us beware of the tentacles of such contradictory notions as pure reason, absolute knowledge, absolute intelligence. All these concepts presuppose an eye such as no living being can imagine. An eye required to have no direction, to abrogate its active and interpretive powers. Precisely those powers that alone make of seeing, seeing something. All seeing is essentially perspective and so is all knowing. This existentialist reference is not arbitrary, for at least in their critique of, obje of objectivism, Marx and Lucas are existential Marxists. Both assert the inescapable involvement of a finite subject of knowledge in the object of its knowledge, and both reject the skeptical consequences that usually derive from this premise by revising the concept of objectivity metacritically in accordance with the epistemological potentialities of a finite being. There's a brief argument in Marx's manuscripts that makes these points with startling effect. In a discussion of the cosmological proof of the existence of God, Marx demands that an imaginary inter interlocutor who questions the source of the universe reflect on his own position in relation to the question. If you ask a question about the creation of nature and man, you abstract from nature and man. You suppose them non-existent and you want me to demonstrate that they exist. I reply. Give up your abstraction, and at the same time, you abandon your question. Or else, if you wanted to maintain your abstraction, be consistent. And if you think of man and nature as non-existent, think of yourself, too, as non-existent, for you are also man and nature. Do not think, do not ask me any questions, for as soon as you think and ask questions, your abstraction from the existence of nature and man becomes meaningless. At issue in this passage is not just the problem of the existence of God, but also the very nature of objectivity. For in denying his interlocutor the right to abstract from his position in existence in order to pose a question about existence, Marx denies that thinking can occupy what Lucas calls a systematic locus, an absolute position of truth beyond all real connection with its objects. In Karl Mannheim's phrase, although not in precisely the sense he intended, thought is essentially sans for bundings. There is a formal similarity between Marx's argument and certain arguments in Kierkegaard. Independent of both Marx and Kierkegaard, Gabriel Marcel developed this type of argument into a methodolo methodology. Like Marx, Marcel challenges the the legitimacy of interrogating being as a whole, and for the same reason, because it involves abstracting from the question, questioner's position in being. A problem like that posed by the cosmological proof is insoluble because it is not a legitimate problem at all. Both Marx and Marcel are concerned to demonstrate the ontological priority of lived experience over its objectivistic um, representation. For Marcel, lived experience is meta-problematical, a domain of mystery that can only be explored from within. Marcel's term mystery is ill-chosen because he does not intend a numinous reality. As he defines it, a mystery is a problem which encroaches on its own data, invading them as it were, and thereby transcending itself as a simple problem. Just so, in Marx, the problem of the existence of the universe encroaches on the subject, who poses it as a problem. Marcel concludes, again, along lines anticipated by Marx, 
that to postulate the meta-problematical is to postulate the primacy of being over knowledge. It is to recognize that knowledge is, as it were, environed by being. Marcel rejects the act of abstraction in which the subject conceives itself as a thing in an, in an external relation with another thing, a body or an object of sensation. What can be so related, he asserts, is only the falsely objectified concept of the mind, whereas the real living subject disappears behind this objective misconstruction in conceiving it. Marcel traces this particular argument back to Hegel. It is not clear to what text in Hegel Marcel refers, but it may well be to the section on reason and the phenomena phenomenology of spirit. There, Hegel attacks every form of, a, of objectivistic reduction of subjectivity as epitomized by phrenology that holds the reality of self-consciousness to consist in the skull bone. Hegel writes, um, brain fibers and the like, looked at as forms of the being of mind are already an imagined, a merely hypothetical actuality of mind, not its presented reality, not its felt seen in short, not its true reality. If they are present to us, if they are seen, they are lifeless objects and then no longer pass for the being of mind. The principle involved in this idea is that reason claims to be all thinghood even thinghood of a purely objective kind. It is this, however, in, con in conceptu, for only this notion is the truth of reason, and the purer the notion itself is, the more silly an idea does it become. In sum, the scholar brain as the material reality of thought exists as such only as an idea for thought. Hence, thought exists as material reality only insofar as that reality is a thought reality. The search for a material foundation for reason ends up ingenuously affirming a thought as reality. Like the hypothesis of the creation of the universe, so in another way the reductionist hypothesis implies the existence of an absolute subject, beyond all but cognitive connection to existence. Marx's argument against the cosmological proof is part of a larger attempt to establish the ontological priority of the lived nature of which we are a part over the objective nature of the natural sciences on which we are a spectator. To accomplish this, he interrupts his imaginary inter interlocutor with the phrase, do not think, do not ask me any questions. He seems to be operating here with a criterion of meaning that restricts propositions about reality to those that can be accounted for in a dialectic of subject and object. His aim is to deny ontology access to the object in itself, as it would appear to a contemplative subject, apart from its relation to human beings and labor and sensation. Otherwise stated, Marx attempts to found his theory on the real or concrete relation of human being to nature, subject to object, which in labor has the form of an essential interdependence rather than founding it on the model of objective nature, we owe to the sciences in which bears no essential relation to humanity. In effect, Marx wants to show that nature as it really is can only be conceived in ontological interdependence with human being. While abstractly conceived, merely external nature must be excluded from philosophical consideration as a meaningless construction. Epistemological Atheism Marx's problematic is also that of Lucas in the Frankfurt School. They all face the difficulties resulting from the metacritical appropriation of the idealist subject-object concept. And like Marx, they propose a solution based on a revision of the concept of objectivity. However, the later thinkers do not question the truth of the natural sciences. As we have seen, Marx seeks a unifying truth that transcends the split between the natural and the social sciences. Unification on these terms devalues the existing natural sciences. Perhaps this made sense in 1844, but by the time Lucas and the Frankfurt School reflect on the issues, 
it is clear that natural science is one of several unsur unsurpassable foundations of modernity. Their solution is not to replace science with another form of thought, but rather to treat it as a social and historical phenomenon. The result is not a unification of forms of knowledge and corresponding objects, but a theory of their relations. I will explain this argument in detail as it applies to Lucas in chapter 6 and Marcuse in chapter 8. The contrast between Marx's approach and that of Lucas is instructive. Lucas proposes a different metacritical reconstruction of objectivity in which mediation rather than experience plays the key role. Where in Marx, labor and sensation have the constitutive power formally attributed by idealism to transcendental consciousness, in Lucas, forms of objectivity established by social practice play the cons constitutive role. In the next chapter, I will show that these forms are roughly equivalent to cultural perspectives. They are not merely mental phenomena, but shape social reality as well. Lucas's argument encloses rationality without remainder in the embrace of these cultural forms and culture itself in social practice. Reason, culture, and practice are stacked like Chinese boxes, the one inside the other, with no way out. No personal discipline, no science, no wisdom can break through this limit. This is an integrally cultural epistemology that admits of no outside of culture from which reality could be viewed, no privileged scientific pre uh, preserve on the margins of the world. So far, Lucas's position appears to be merely relativistic, and this is indeed how it was understood by those who, like Karl Mannheim, attempted to elaborate a sociology of knowledge on the basis of his concept of false consciousness. However, the intrinsic dependency of knowledge on consciousness and culture is not incompatible with a concept of truth. Lucas insists that the social involvement of the subject is a necessary precondition for knowing and not just a barrier from which a pure science would have to abstract. This is a metacritical reconstruction of the concept of knowledge in the, rel in the relative, under a finite horizon, rather than a skeptical critique of human limits in the light of an attainable absolute truth. Lucas's main target in these epistemological considerations is objectivism and with it the idea that being in itself transcends the reach of social practice. Objectivism leads to dogmatic claims to knowledge of being, or on the contrary, to relati relativism, which denies such claims on the basis of a similar conception of truth. Both objectivism and relativism presupposes an absolute in the form of the systematic locus of thought as a supposed spectator on a reality in which it does not in principle, participate. This absolute, Lucas writes, is nothing but the fixation in thought, the projection into myth of the intellectual failure to understand reality concretely as a historical process. That failure results in a misapprehension of culture, the repository of society's most general categories of thought and action. Cultural assumptions are conceived as eternal or transcendental, as prior to the real process and founding for it. The absolute is this appearance of culture at the horizon of history as an unchanging essence. Lucas reverses this formula. It is not in transcending history that the truth is to be found, but in the recognition of the historical character of all transcendence. For Lucas, society cannot be known in the absolute, but it can indeed be known from within. Lucas traces the fixation of thought in a realm beyond history to specific social causes. The absolute and its correlated concept of the relative appear in response to the untranscended untranscend immediacies of experience in class society. Because conscious cooperation is so difficult and rare in this type of society, whole domains of social reality confront the individuals as alien powers over which they have no control. The dominant culture can serve its historical function of justifying class rule only insofar as this function remains unconscious, insofar therefore as culture itself appears as eternal truth. 
the illusion of a transhistorical systematic locus of thought corresponds to this untransformed reality and uncomprehended culture. Lucas argues that the proletariat throws these immediacies into the movement of history and subjects them to a practical mediation that decisively alters the position of truth. Proletarian practice acts on the form of objectivity of its objects. It consciously transforms culture and therefore reality as well. And as the expression of a cooperative and potentially universal historical subject, this practice need not accept any merely given immediacy as its horizon. As soon as mankind has clearly understood and hence restructured the foundations of its existence, truth acquires a wholly novel aspect. When theory and practice are united, it becomes possible to change reality. And when this happens, the absolute and its relativistic, rel relativistic counterpart will have played their historical role for the last time. For as the result of these changes, we shall see the disappearance of that reality which the absolute and the relative expressed in like manner. The idea of theory as, a, as observation of reality from a, a disincarnated beyond is overthrown. Theory becomes finite when it is located in a process of conscious cultural change. Nietzsche claimed that truth was the last idol of a disenchanted world, the final form in which the eternal ripped the seamless web of time. Marx and Lucas too proceed to humanize truth itself, to make it enter into time as a real moment in the creation of history. They reject any ontological barrier between perceiver and perceived, subject and object, form and content. Reality is a social product and not a thing in itself that precedes society and which would have to be perceived from a scientific beyond of culture to be known in its truth. This reality produced in a social process can be known in the forms of its production. This interpretation of philosophy of praxis suggests yet another similarity with existentialism. Marx's and Lucas's position resembles the phenomenological concept of horizon as a limit under which thought proceeds. Kant would seem to be the primary reference for this approach to the problem of meaning. It was he who first suggested that there are specific limits to the range of application of the categories of experience, the employment of reason beyond the domain of possible experience, that is to say in relation to being in itself, gives rise to a transcendental illusion. Marx and Lucas retain the Kantian idea of limiting the application of the categories to the possible experience of a finite subject, but they reject the postulated transcendence of the thing in itself as a theological vestige. They thus arrive at what I call a finite horizon of being and knowledge. In 1935, Ma uh, Max Horkheimer laid out a similar conception in an essay on the problem of truth. In this essay, Horkheimer presents an extended argument for the finit finitude of thought, which will be determining for the Frankfurt School. Notwithstanding his explicit rejection of such Lu Lucasian categories as subject-object identity, the unity of theory and practice, and totality, the argument is quite close in spirit to that of Lucas. Horkheimer criticizes both absolutism and dogmatism on the grounds that they presuppose an incoherent confusion of the eternal and the temporal. The human subject situated in history is called to think eternal truths, a task at which it may be said to succeed or fail, but which is, in any case, self-contradictory. This essentially theological concept of truth must itself be questioned in terms of a historical and dialectical alternative. Since that extra historical and hence exaggerated concept of truth is impossible, which stems from the idea of a pure infinite mind, and thus in the last analysis from the concept of God, is no longer, it no longer makes any um, sense to orient the knowledge we have to this impossibility. And, then, and in this sense, call it relative. Once it is admitted that the subject of knowledge is a historical being and not what Lucas calls a systematic locus, uh, 
then it follows that truth too must be conceived historically. This has two implications Horkheimer develops in some detail. On the one hand, the fullest understanding of particular truths requires that they be considered in the context of the overall system of knowledge of the historical period in which they appear. Knowledge rests not only on corroboration by the facts, but also in the validity of its concepts within the prevailing categorical system. On the other hand, that system of categories is historically relative to evolving social and economic conditions. While Horkheimer does not designate such a cate categorical system by the term form of objectivity, it is clear that he has something similar in mind, an underlying cognitive pattern. Although particular truths depend on the system of categories of their time, this does not devalue them as relativism believes. Because there are no eternal truths setting a higher standard they fail to meet. This has a surprising consequence. At the same time as truth nevertheless necessarily remains inconclusive, and to that extent relative, it is also absolute, since later, cor uh, since later correction does not mean that a former truth was formally untrue. Judgments of truth are objectively valid even if historically relative and retain their validity even after history has moved on and replaced one set of categories with another. Horkheimer gives the example of a diagnosis of tuberculosis. It may be correct or incorrect in terms of contemporary medical knowledge and retains its truth value in the former case regardless of the future evolution of medicine. Suppose that someday the very categories of medicine will have changed so much that the concept of tuberculosis will appear to its practitioners as irrelevant as do the humors of pre-modern medicine to physicians today. This development may represent a progress of knowledge, but it does not alter the truth value of the diagnosis made at the time when the categorical structure of contemporary knowledge supported the concept of tuberculosis. <clears throat> In this sense, a truth may be historically bound without being falsified by history. Horkheimer applies this argument to science generally. Its truths are more or less successfully verified on its own terms, but this in no way exempts science from the historical dialectic. Indeed, any relation of concept and object can historically, can, object not historically mediated, no longer appears meaningful as an idea. The historical relativity of science appears clearly as soon as one more closely investigates the controlling categories and the choice of objects and methods. This conclusion is in surprising agreement with contemporary science studies. Where Horkheimer's argument differs most from that of Lucas is in the vagueness of his discussion of the ontological role of human action. While he asserts, <clears throat> while he asserts that action is implicated in the verification of ideas about society, it is unclear how and to what extent. Lucas's similar argument comes to a clear conclusion. Once human beings consciously control the categorical structure of existence itself, the very idea of a reality wholly separate from the subject collapses in absurdity. Knowledge is essentially mediation between an ontologically interdependent subject and object, not the communication of an isolated subject with an indifferent and alien thing in itself. But this conclusion rests suspiciously on the hypothetical success of the revolution in actually transforming social reality. Horkheimer is anxious to resist any pragmatic reduction of truth to success. And this is what creates the ambiguity in his, in his argument. <laughs> he accepts the Luc Lucasian premise that knowledge of history is not purely contemplative, but he fears that the Lucasian conclusion will lead to a mere consecration of the victors and a time when progressive forces are everywhere in retreat. <clears throat> As a result, he confines his argument to epistemology,
and insists on the relative independence of theory and practice. We will see that this position is central to the later Frankfurt School. It marks the division between what Lucas called the era of the actuality of the revolution and a later period, which, following Marcuse, we could describe as the era of preventative counter-revolution. 